Wow. Amen, amen. It's like every time I hear them sing, I just want them to sing more. It's like, do you guys feel that same thing? Like when they're just singing, it's just like, mm, just makes me feel like, it makes me feel excited every time someone's singing. But just give a hand for our praise team because they're just, they're so amazing. They're so amazing. Well, good morning, good morning. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Today's a blessed day, is it not? Today's a blessed day, is it not? It's the Sabbath. Thank you. It's a big group. We should all, we should all be, we should all feel blessed. If you're not, we'll be praying too. Um, today, I will be giving this sermon, and I am a student, a senior, attending Thunderbird Adventist Academy. I am senior class pastor, and they were told I should give a fun fact. I was told to give a fun fact. So a fun fact about me is I can do the splits. I won't do it on stage, though. Don't expect that to happen. That's not happening today. Okay. Let's say a quick prayer before we get into things. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you that it's the Sabbath, Lord, and that we can all be here together to praise and worship, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you give us the Holy Spirit so we can spiritually discern what is spiritually given to us. Lord, you be the painting and I be the no. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So my sermon title today is, I Know Who My God Is. That is a very bold statement to just come straight out the bat. But, but let me break it down for you guys. I have a few questions to ask before we get into this. So first question is, what is an idol? By raise of hand, would we... Can, will we just say that we all know what an idol is? Just anybody? Can someone tell me, Miss um, Ugana, can you tell me what an idol is? Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so anything that we put before God. Yes? What, what's an idol? <laughs> okay, it could be made out of gold, iron, and wood. I like that. Would we agree that could be an idol too, right? Okay. So I'm a guy that goes by a definition base. It helps me break it down easier. And <laughs> yes, we see Kanye out there. Let me get into that. But a definition out of the Oxford Dictionary is an image or representation of a God used as an object of worship. Pay attention to this last part. An extended usage, a person or thing that is greatly admired, loved, or revered. Just, I'm going to read that one more time. An extended usage, a person or thing that is greatly admired, loved, or revered. You see, that means that people that we put in front of us, things that we look to can be a form of idols. You know, Kanye could be an idol, but he elevates himself, and he has on record saying that he calls himself a god, right? That's what he says. He said, I am a god. So his idol could be himself, because it could be a person or a thing. Now, the next question is, what is worship? Who would agree, or just by raise a hand, that today what we're doing is a form of worship? Anybody? Okay, who would agree that going to a concert is a form of worship? Anyone? Okay, so we have this idea of what worship is. And definition-based, worship is the practice of showing respect for God or a God by saying prayers, singing with others, etc. So now we have this two words that we can combine together, and we can get both definitions and put them together, and we have this beautiful thing called idol worship. You see, definitions combined together says this, an image, an object, or a person that is being shown great respect as if a god. Doing daily practice and giving time to this said object, image, or representation, loving it greatly, admiring it, and revering it. You guys might want to write that down a little bit, just because... This is exactly what idol worship is. It's getting, it's going day in and day out, giving practice to this, giving practice to whatever it may be, a person, an image, or a thing that you hold greatly in your life. As a matter, it could be, it could be my Chromebook that I I say I hop in and I'm just like going in classes and every morning I'm doing my classes, I'm doing my work, and that could be part of my idol worship because I'm putting that above everything else, right? You see, we got idol worship in today. What does that look like today? Well, we have in modern day and even back in time when Hinduism was created, we have the elephant god and they, all, they have the, all their multiple gods. Our class did take a trip to the, where, where was it again? The Hindu temple, yeah. We took a trip to the Hindu temple and the, the guy, he was so nice. I love that guy. He was, he was one of the coolest people ever. He's just really chill, really laid back, but he's just willing to answer all our questions even if they're crazy. And they believe in actual idol worship and going to the statue and praying to it and giving, they, and giving that worship to it. And we see it in the entertainment industry today. We see with, um, in Marvel, literally you have Odin, Thor, Loki, God straight out of Greek mythology, right? We have Kanye elevating himself up and saying that he is a god, right? 
and so that his ad worship could be a form to himself, right? And if you know anything about sports, if you know anything about basketball, we all can say that Michael Jordan is one of the greatest to play the game. And there's an interview done with Kevin Garnett, and he says, he goes on statement saying that you don't mess with black Jesus. And that's, that's what he said. And so a form of idol worship could be to that. A form of idol worship could be to, I want to get there. I want to be that. I want to embody that spirit, right? So let's take a trip. Let's go to Exodus 3. And let's read verses 7 to 10. Exodus 3, 7 to 10 says this. Then the Lord said, I have seen how cruelly my people are being treated in Egypt. I have heard them cry out to be rescued from their slave drivers. I know all about their sufferings. And so I have come down to rescue them from the Egyptians and to bring them out of Egypt to a spacious land, one which is rich and fertile, and which the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Wow, that's a lot of sites. Oh my goodness. I have indeed heard the cry of my people, and I see how the Egyptians are oppressing them. Now I am sending you to the king of Egypt so that you can lead my people out of this country. This chapter is the, the burning bush experience for Moses, where he, Moses, you know, he's sending his sheep, he's taking care of the things that he has to take care of out in the wilderness, and he sees a bush burning, but it doesn't completely go away. It goes up to it, and it's God speaking to him, and he's freaking out. But he's listening because, I mean, if a bush is burning and talking to you, I mean, I'd listen if I was Moses, right? But he listens to it. And this is the experience when he tells him to go. And this is one of the, one of the um, first times that we're seeing Egy- ancient Egyptian culture being used. We see it in Genesis 37 when it talks about Joseph and it talks about, um, and talks about how he got sold into slavery, into Egypt, and he comes second in command. But this is really where we start to see this form of idol worship and really get to see it expanded in the Bible. So here's a few gods that I have on the screen. And we have Horus, Osiris, Ra, Anubis. And these were all gods that were very highly revered, especially during this dynasty of ancient Egypt. You see, they respected these gods. They would give prayer and worship to these gods daily. No matter if you were a, no matter if you were just low common or if you were high ranking, even the Pharaoh would respect these gods, right? A type of uh, form that a form of worship and sacrifice that they would do would actually be to sacrifice, and you see right here, you see right there, this is a, this is a hieroglyphic of them sacrificing humans for the Pharaoh, so that in the afterlife, he would be able to have um, high-ranking officials, family members, or even servants with him that would be, that would be with him in the afterlife, and the afterlife was explain how they explain it it's very it's very just kind of sad it's like you live your life the best you can and even if even if you're a low if you're kind of low you can still be eaten by the crocodile that would kill you or and if you're high and you got lived a great life you get to go into this beautiful heaven but they would they would give these form of worship to the pharaoh as sacrificing people and you see the pharaoh got to this point of where he thought he was a god where he became he himself elevated himself so high to think that he was a god. His idol worship became less of like the gods around him and became more of him. And so when God tells, uh, when God tells Moses to go out there and tell the Pharaoh to, uh, tells Moses to let, the, to let the people go, to, let the Pharaoh, to tell people to let Mos- uh, the Israelites go, my bad. Um, he says this in Exodus 4.21. Again, the Lord said to Moses, now that you're going back to Egypt, be sure to perform before the king all the miracles which I have given you the power to do so. But I will make the king stubborn, and he will not let the people go. I'm going to repeat that last part. It says, but I will make the king stubborn, and he will not let the people go. In Exodus 8, 12 to 15, it says that after Moses and Aaron left Pharaoh, Moses cried cried out to the Lord about the frogs he had brought on Pharaoh. And the Lord did what Moses asked. The frogs died in the houses, in the courtyards, and in the fields. They replied, they piled into heaps, and the land reeked of them. But when Pharaoh saw that there was a relief, he hardened his heart and would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. And there's two other places where Pharaoh hardens his own heart. And just a verse before, it says, and just a chapter before, it says that God will will make the Pharaoh's heart harden. But you see, there's a rock that Jesus built that he cannot break, and that's the rock of free will. How, does, how is he able to harden Pharaoh's heart? We see he was giving him the desires of his own heart. He was letting Pharaoh 
give, uh, have his own desires of his own heart. And he thought he was so high. He thought he was so elevated. He thought he himself was a God that no one could touch him, right? And so when he doesn't listen, God brings on the plagues. And these plagues were directed more towards the gods that they would give fellowship, they would give um, idol worship to day in and day out. But this last plague was directed towards the Pharaoh. You see, Pharaoh, when all the other plagues were going on, when everything else was happening, Pharaoh wasn't really affected because it was just the country. It was just everything going on around him, right? But something hit Pharaoh, the death of his firstborn. You see, once he realized that he couldn't bring the firstborn back, right? Once he realizes that he couldn't do that, he had to realize that he wasn't that guy. He realized that he, was not, he couldn't be that elevated God that he, could, that he thought he was. He said that he himself was God, and he acted as himself was a God. And then when that was shipped away from him, he had nothing less. Let's take a trip forward. Let's go into the Kings. Let's go into the Chronicles. During this time is after a while when God had gotten the Israelites out of slavery from the Egyptians and from Pharaoh and all that. They're going in and out of slavery and going up and down. And here's a verse that really just embodies the spirit of how the, what the Israelites were doing. It says in 2 Kings 17, 17. Then they made their sons, their daughters, pass through the fire and practiced divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him. You see, the people had gotten so dark in their ways that they were giving up their sons and their daughters for the idols that they were worshiping, and a big idol back then was Baal. You see, they would give their sons, their daughters up to Baal. They would practice and do all these things every day, and their idol worship was towards Baal, and it became so to the point that God was just being provoked. You see, in the original Hebrew, it, uh, Baal means owner or lord, and he's a god of fertility, prosperity. He's a god of rain and storms, right? You see, the people were so deep in their ways that they were giving, they were actually building, like you said, they're made out of gold, wood, or stone. They were building these idols just to give it worship, just to do these things, and I like this, I like this story, Elijah versus the prophets of Baal. In 1 Kings 18, this is where the story is found, you know, God tells Elijah to go up to King Ahab and he tells him to just say what he's doing, to just say what's up, say that he's feeling provoked, say that he's getting annoyed at this, saying what's happening, right? And he's talking to Ahab, and Ahab's just like, okay, if you really think that your God is so great and that your God is so powerful, I'm going to have 450 of the prophets of Baal versus you, versus one guy. So he says, okay, well, we're going to set it up. You know, they, go to Mount, they go to Mount Carmel. They go up to Mount Carmel. They set up two bulls, and it's in like, kind of just like a big area it's on top of the mountain. Set up two bulls on this offering plate just so that they can do their rituals and so that they can do the things that they had to do in order to offer their offering. And you know, perhaps Abel go first. Elijah says, you guys got it first. 450 of them doing the rituals, doing the stuff, and it got to the point where it says in verse 28, and they cried aloud and cut themselves after the custom with swords and lances until blood gushed out upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation, but there is no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. No voice. No one answered. No one paid attention after hours of screaming, after so much cutting of themselves, after doing so much, nothing was there. No one said anything to them. It got to the point where Elijah was making fun of them. He's like, hey, I think your guy's like, he's in the bathroom or something. Maybe he's sleeping right now, or maybe he's on vacation. I think you guys might be annoying him or something like that. It got to that point, right? And so Elijah goes next, and he, he, he tells them, all right, let's build some trenches around this. Let's build some trenches around this thing. Let's fill it up with water. Let's fill it all the way up with water. And Elijah goes there. He says, all right, that's good, that's good. It's all filled up with water. Trenches are filled up. The boys are all covered in water. And he goes up. And all he says is this. He says, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things in your command. Answer me so that the people will know you are God. And right after he says that, automatically, shh, poof, the whole thing is consumed. The water even, the bulls even. 
And you see, all he had to do was acknowledge who God was and say, Lord, I know who you are and I know what you can do, so show the people what you can do. And automatically, boom, God was there. You see, they, they, they cut themselves, right? They gave up themselves to the idol. The prophet Sabel did, and no one answered, right? You see, Pharaoh had elevated himself, but when he lost everything, when he lost something that was so important to them, he lost himself, right? And you see, I know who my God is. He's a God that will use people for the betterment of their salvation. You know, they say that hurt people hurt people, but my God used hurt people to love people. He uses hurt people to be there for people. He uses hurt people to help people, to help the needy, help the blind, help the naked, help the people that are definitely there that need it when they have no one else. God is there to be their lifeline. And again, I say I know who my God is, but how can I say that, and how do, how do I understand that, right? Well, I relate this understanding of knowing who my God is with the relationship that I have with my father. You see, I, w- I wish he was here right now. I really do. He's, he's sick right now, guys. He's back at home, but dad, I, I, just want, I want you to hear, to hear this part. Look, you see, with my dad, when I was younger, I always, it's always, I was just always excited to go see him. I always tell him about the cool things that I would do, like right after, right after uh, school, right after coming from the park, and I'll be like, hey, dad, look at this new move. I did this crossover. I, it was always about basketball, always about basketball. Like, dad, look at this new move. Look at this crossover that I did. I had him on the ground. I went for a layup, and I saw him there, and he'd always be so excited to listen to me tell his stories, right? He'd be so excited. He'd sit there. He'd listen to me. He'd care for me. He'd give me the advice I needed if I wanted more, right? You know, as I'm learning to ride the bike, he's teaching me to ride the bike. No trainer wheels on the back. I'm going down the hill, right? I'm going down this hill, and every time I keep going down, and I just keep falling. I scrape my knees. I scrape my arms, but my dad's still there. He tells me to get back up, do it again. Even though I keep falling and keep falling, he's right there to tell me how to do it, and he's critiquing me along the way, but he knows that I have to keep falling. There's a point where I have to keep falling so that I can get back up and understand how to not fall again. See, my dad was there for me when I needed him as a, little, as a little kid, but you know, as you get older, it becomes less about basketball and bikes, and it becomes, Dad, who, who, who am I? What, what am I doing? I don't know why I'm thinking these thoughts. I don't know where I'm going. Dad, help me. And my dad, when I'm in those low points, when I'm in those points of not knowing what's next, he sat there with me. He talked to me. He gave me the advice I needed in those moments. You know, we can do the same thing with God, right? See, our theme for this school year is call your lifeline today. Call your lifeline today. That's the theme for our, for our school year. And you see, I'm going to go back to idol worship for a second. You see, in idol worship, it says, I wish my dreams would come true, right? I wish my dreams would come true. You know, we work ourselves up to the point where we elevate ourselves so high and we think that we're going to become the best in whatever category that we get in or we give ourselves solely to the artist, solely to the entertainment business, solely to everything, right? But then we realize we have nothing when it comes down to it. You know, the worship of God says, I wish that I knew sooner. I wish I knew sooner the love that he had for us, the love that he gave for us, the love that he poured out for us. You know, they, the, the prophets of Baal, they cut themselves until they bled. But Jesus came down for us, and he, he gave up everything until he was dead. He was the sacrifice for us. He wanted us to have another chance at salvation. And so calling your lifeline will be able to, that, that's something that will just be there for you, right? That God, God gave up himself solely so that we can have that. We have, to, we have to think about that. We have to, be, we have to think about, do I want to keep pursuing something that is on a dying planet? Or do I want to get something that is going to have me, help me have everlasting life with somebody that loves me so much to give himself up? So I challenge you to wake up in the morning, give him two minutes, just two minutes, just two minutes. Actually, 30 seconds. <laughs> Okay, go at nighttime, give him 30 more seconds. And then you're gonna realize, oh, 30 seconds is not enough time. This is not enough time. 
I need more. I need more. I, I, my, my cord's running short. I need more, Lord. I need more. Right? And then you're going to realize, oh, every day I get to know who my God is. Right? I get to understand who my God is. It becomes something less of what you want and more of, God, is this what you want? And just like Elijah just sat there and he said, Lord, show them who you are. And he was there in a moment. He was there right then. He will be there for us. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you that you brought us together, Lord. I thank you that you bless us, Lord. That we don't have to be the ones who build our own life, Lord. That you can do it for us, Lord. You know, you used people that we, we couldn't even imagine being used. I mean, think about the disciples. They were just a group of, a group of boys, and you used them. You think about Paul, and you used them too. You used him even though he was killing your kids, but you said, Lord, you, sa- you said, you went to him, and you said, why do you, why do you murder and kill my kids? You loved him, even in the times of his darkness, just as much as you love us in our times of darkness, Lord. Pray, Lord, that your message reached out to somebody, anybody, Lord, and that they can get a hold of the lifeline today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.